going to speak to us tonight uh, on silviculture, and we're very excited to have him. And uh, Ashley and I are Master Gardener Coordinators for University of Maryland Extension. I work in Allegheny County, and Ashley works in Garrett County. So uh, we're hosting this series of events, and we just are very thankful that uh, you have decided to join us this evening. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan and just uh, remind you that if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box, and we'll try to answer them as we go along. And hopefully there will be some time at the end of the evening to answer questions as well. So thank you for being here. Well, great. So can you all hear me? This is, uh, this is Jonathan Kayes. I'm going yes. to, um, I'm an extension forester with University of Maryland Extension. I'm located at, near Hagerstown at the Western Maryland Research and Education Center. And I'm gonna talk about silviculture tonight. Uh, let me share my screen here and um, get everything, make sure everything works. Okay. While he's doing that, I just wanna let everyone know that we are uh, gonna record this for those who can't make it or wanna review it. So it's recording now. Okay, hold on just one minute. And I was trying to um, set up the chat box so I could see the chat, there it is. That's great. So, um, you know, my background, uh, I come in from a um, bit of forestry time. And I think silviculture is something that just a lot of people don't uh, understand what it is. My goal here tonight is to maybe give you a, a, short, a, a short lesson and make you realize that silviculture is basically an art and a science. And it's, it's how we grow forests. And, and it differs from arboriculture, which many people have heard of, which deals mostly with individual trees. You know, how do we... Um, how do we manage individual trees? And unlike that, we're talking here about a forest. Okay, I need to, um, okay, there it goes. We have a, a website. This is all part of our Woodland Stewardship Education Program that we have with Extension. And a lot, we have a lot of resources related to forest and wildlife management. Um, of course, it includes silviculture at extension.umd.edu slash woodland. A uh, number of online courses in forestry. Uh, wildlife management, as well as a Woods in Your Backyard online course. And uh, so I would encourage you to check out the resources that we have there. So silviculture, um, it's really an art and science of continually producing and managing forests uh, to attend not just sustained yields of crops, uh, forest crops, which is a very traditional use, but other benefits um, as well through the applications of silvix. And, and silvix is understanding the specific characteristics and characters of how trees grow, uh, how they regenerate, and all those, those kinds of things. Um, so it's an art in that we're developing prescriptions in terms of what we can do to a forest to meet certain goals of objectives. And because different people's goals and objectives are different, there's no one correct prescription in many cases. Uh, they can be adjusted to accomplish, you know, different ends over time. And, and it's a science in that there's a lot of research and a lot of science involved in, in, in silviculture and, and understanding how forests work. Not just the identification of trees, but the assessment of where trees grow and those site characteristics, collecting data, and, you know, application of different types of treatments. So it's a very developed, uh, developed science. Um, and, and in some places, you know, silviculture kind of simulates a controlled natural disaster. We, we know that forests are very dynamic and they're changing all the time, uh, even though slowly sometimes, but sometimes not so slowly. We get major, you know, weather events and things like that. Um, so, you know, it allows us to designate how and when forests are regenerated. In other words, we can control those natural disasters, if you want to look at it that way, in terms of what's going to be removed or what's going to be favored. And by doing that, you know, we have a lot of influence over the forest structure and the composition, the species that we're going to leave, the ones we're going to take. And sometimes that's good, but if it's not done properly, uh, it, can be, it, it can be not so good. So um, we want to make sure we make the right decisions based on, you know, some good, good data and good science. Um, and of course, integral of this is the whole issue of wildlife habitat because we manage wildlife habitat by managing 
uh, by, by managing forests. You know, we're managing wildlife by managing habitat. And the most cost effective and easy way to manage wildlife habitat is through good forestry practices that we can use. And of course, we talk about sustainably managing these forest resources for, for many, many generations to come. Uh, the science of silviculture has developed over, you know, hundreds of years, you know, um, starting with, uh, you know, in, in medieval times, you know, and basically the king would set, medieval kings would set aside woods from the public so they wouldn't get uh, decimated. And, you know, the first uh, forestry school in Nancy, uh, Nancy, France, 1802 to 1865. And using that same idea of imitating nature and hastening its work, which is the maxim of silviculture. So silviculture has been around a long time, started in Europe uh, primarily, and uh, that's where we got it from. Uh, the early forestry, first forestry school, anybody who's been down to uh, the Biltmore estate, uh, that was where the first forestry school was. Um, you know, the uh, George Vanderbilt, you know, built that and he hired Gifford Pinchot, who was the, uh, became our first forester for the US Forest Service in 1913, I think it was. Uh, and they started a forestry school down there in 1898. And so again, based primarily on a lot of European, which was a lot of pine management and, and things like that. And we've kind of developed that over the years. So this whole science of silviculture uh, and its development has been around camp coming from Europe primarily and adapted to the systems that we find uh, in the United States, which are you know, a little bit different in some cases than, than you find in Europe. So it's just not something we just created, you know, it was just, it just happened to come around recently. Um, so sustainable management in terms of, we put the frame, but that's how we frame silviculture is, you know, we want to do silviculture and, 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 and sustainable management of our woods in a way that meets our needs today, but it's going to meet the future generations, uh, their needs as well. You know, so we have to make smart decisions and we have to use good silvicultural methods. Um, and, and, and some of this is based on the thing that, you know, we, we have a lot of concerns recently because the United States, and especially in, uh, in Eastern United States where we are, we all grow some of the best hardwood uh, timber in the world and it's exported to all around the world. And there have been concerns in the past that a lot of the harvesting that's taking place of this high quality wood that's out there has not been done in a sustainable fashion. And, um, you know, a study that was done back in the late 90s, you know, found that only about 38% of the time the harvest, when they looked at a number of harvests in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, New York, were really done in a sustainable fashion. In other words, they were cut in a way that you would leave a really a quality forest there that could regenerate into the future. Um, and, and what that means is that 60 to 70% of the time, the harvests were not all that sustainable. What, what was being left was, you know, not quality trees um, that didn't really have a, a great future. Um, and, and, you know, results in some denigration of the genetics and other things. So, you know, this has been a concern and uh, being addressed by the, by the forestry profession to make sure that landowners get good assistance and they make wise decisions, um, as well as on, you know, public properties, of course. And, you know, sustainable silviculture requires planning, like anything else. You know, if you're going to build a house, you're going to get, you're going to come out a lot better than plans if you show up there with a bunch of two by fours and say, well, I wonder how we're going to put this together. And, and we're fortunate in the state of Maryland that we, our DNR Forest Service has professional foresters in each county that can help landowners, um, you know, make, um, uh, develop forest stewardship plans for their properties. Uh, pretty much restricted to people that have at least 10 acres of woodland. And, you know, we do have some programs for people with smaller properties as well, but the whole idea of a map and inventory and looking at what's there and, you know, understanding what's going to be cut and why and what the end objective is, that's all the basis that goes into sustainable silviculture, but it requires planning because, you know, once you cut the trees, you can't put them back. And uh, that's just a fact of life. So it's kind of like, you know, um, a carpenter, right? You know, measure twice, cut once. Well, <laughs> in the case of woodlands, it's, you know, make sure that you uh, understand exactly what the implications are of what's being done. So, and that's a process that includes, you know, careful identification of, of, of the objectives of the landowner. 
and you know, 70, about 75% of the forest land in the state of Maryland is owned by private landowners. Most people don't know that. They think the government owns most of the forest land, but that's not the case. Now I will say in Garrett and Allegheny County, it's a higher, uh, it's a, a higher uh, state ownership, but still uh, largely um, uh, privately owned overall. So you need an inventory of the resources. You know, we need to, before we do any harvesting or planting for that matter, especially harvesting, we want to know about the health and the vigor and the structure of the forest there, that's there and developing a management strategy and recommendations that meet certain objectives and, you know, produce a, uh, using good silviculture practices. You know, those practices that are going to produce a healthy forest, a vigorous forest, and one that can produce, you know, products for the future with some periodic reevaluation. And that's what you see here is a landowner meeting with a forester. Um, and uh, you know, this is a, the front of a, a written forest stewardship plan provided by state foresters. And there are also private foresters that can provide these as well. Uh, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, so how do we get all this information? I mean, what information do we need? Well, this is really, you know, really what's involved with, um, with sound silviculture practices going in and getting the data we need. You know, you looking at the forestry toolbox, you know, what species are growing there? What's the size of the trees, the age of the trees, the distribution quality? And then beyond just the actual trees is where are those trees growing? You know, what is the aspect? What direction is that hill facing? You know, if it's facing west, it's gonna be a drier slope if it's facing north. And the soils are gonna be different. Moisture, and then of course history and, uh, uh, you know, one of the largest impacts on forest structure is, is past use, you know, because was that area a former pasture that grew back? Has it been a woodland for a long period of time? These are the things that a professional forester is going to look at when they come onto a piece of property and want to do an assessment, um, whether, no, no matter who owns the land, uh, that's how we make wise decisions. And, and I want to emphasize this idea of site because this is something that's a little, uh, a little, little vague in some people's minds, but understand that when you go along the mountains and along the land, you know, the actual site is uh, the combination of all those biotic and climatic and topographic factors, soil conditions, and any one area. It's that, it's that environment. And what that means is that when you look at this, this, this slope I have here, uh, this picture pictorial, those trees and those forests that are growing at the bottom are gonna be more fertile forests. There's more water down there, there's deeper soils. Compared to those ones that are higher up on the mountain, the thinner soils, it's going to grow a different type of forest. Uh, is it more exposed to the sun than others? And I don't wanna get into a lot of specifics of that here, except to say that site is a major, a major issue in terms of, because certain forests we can expect are going to grow more, they just produce more. Uh, they have a, a different dynamic than f other, other forests that uh, uh, might, might, might be in a different location. And, and the site's important because it's pretty fixed. You know, the soils that are there and the climate that's there is fairly stable and fairly easily defined. But the point is that what's growing there really reflects the disturbance of past land use. So if that area had been a pasture and grown back into woodland, it's probably gonna have certain characteristics compared to one that had been recently harvested. And, and a lot of foresters understand these dynamics, but just because what's growing there doesn't mean exactly what can grow there. That's I guess what I'm getting at. So even though the forest may be in terrible shape through some sound silvicultural practices, it can be brought around again to be a, a more vigorous, diverse forest with a you know, better species for wildlife and everything else. And likewise, if you know a good, a good vigorous forest is not treated properly through sound harvesting and practices, it can be degraded, and that's and that's a big concern. So the other issue that enters in here is is succession. You know how it enters into silviculture and decisions because you know the forest changes as it grows. So the early forest, younger forest, has more intolerant trees, ones that are more sun loving. And over time, you know, it transitions into forests that are more uh, composed of tolerant trees, trees that can grow in the shade of other trees, you know, your oaks and uh, sugar maple and beech and stuff like that. So um, this is a whole progression of plant, plant communities so that we know through 
silvicultural practices, again, understanding how the species grow and, and their history and all this other thing and all the other site factors, what kind of things that can we do and what are gonna be the outcomes of different types of um, uh, you know, decisions that we may make? You know, if we remove these trees, what's gonna to happen to these trees? And those all have to be taken with the context of the, of the site that's there but also in terms of the successional stages there, because you know when we cut trees, we push succession back to a younger younger age, and likewise. So so that changes the whole dynamic of how it's going to redevelop from then on. And so you know we're managing this whole dynamic, and 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 you thought when you walked in the woods it's just a bunch of trees. Well, there's actually a lot of dynamics that go on there, and when you change the the the, the fact that are there in the speech, it can result in a whole different uh, progression to the future, which is, which is okay. Um, you know, I cannot see my um, uh, chat box because it, it closes every time I change my slides. So if there is a, a question, you'll have to, uh, uh, to tell me. Um, We're doing okay so, for now. Okay. So, so as a forest develops, um, what do forests need to grow? What do trees need to grow? Well, they need light, water, and nutrients, okay? But if you're at any one spot, uh, it's typically light that's most important. You know, trees are in this constant um, uh, competition for light to see which ones can get to the light. And the ones that get the most of the light are the ones that are gonna be most successful. So when we look at a crown a canopy of a forest here and we see these dominant trees, which are their bigger trees and co-dominance and suppressed, which are ones that are covered up. In many cases, these trees are all the same age, okay? And, and the reasons that one tree is bigger than another is because, uh, you know, they just were more competitive. They were able to outgrow and, 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 and uh, out, you know, outpace the other, the other trees. It could be the exact same species. And so many times people go in the forest and they'll see, well, there's all chestnut oak trees, but they're all different diameters. And in many cases, those woods were basically all the same age. They all came up at the same time, but some won out in the, in, in the uh, competition for light compared to some of the others. So, um, so you have all these you know, different species, but let's say you have the same species how do I know how much a forest can grow? What, what do I know about that issue about site quality? I mean, how can I say that this is a better site for growing, say, uh, uh, oak trees compared to that site? And um, that's a good question. And again, a lot of research and science is going in to answer these questions. Um, and, and I just want to introduce this concept to you because this is one technique that uh, foresters use. They use this idea of site index. And I want you to just hang in with me there for a minute. But it turns out if you have, let's say you have a piece of ground, okay, and you have two trees of the same species, okay, and um, uh, well, they're in different pieces of ground, but let's say you have these two trees. If those trees, assuming they haven't been, um, they've been free to grow their entire life, okay, the amount of the amount of the, the 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 tree that's on a more fertile growing site or a site with better site quality conditions is going to grow taller than the other tree. Okay, assuming that it's within a range of crowding that's acceptable, and that's interesting. People, you think about that. So these, this tree, uh, we by measuring the total height at a certain age, we can have an indicator of site quality. You know how how big that tree is going to be at a certain age. So if I go down the mountain uh, to another part of the mountain where the soils and the, the site's different, I have that same species of tree and it's been free to grow its entire life. It hasn't been covered by other trees. And I can measure the total age and the total height. I can tell which of those sites is a better growing site for trees, for that species. And I, I know that sounds kind of bizarre, but uh, it, it's, it's an interesting thing that we can do uh, and foresters can do to measure an idea of how productive, you know, a forest is by measuring a site index. And I, I have an example here for you. Um, can you see my cursor on here? Yeah, uh, I can. Okay, yeah. So let's say we have this tree and I go out and I measure its total height and it's about, you know, 90, 95 feet tall, okay? And I use a 
bore and go into the tree and it's about 55 trees, 55 foot long, 55 years old. All these curves are based on going out and measuring a lot of trees in the forest across different sites. I can say that site area has a site index of 90 feet. And what that means is that at 50 years old, everything is normalized at 50 years old, I can say that that tree is gonna be 90 feet tall, okay? And this may be a little too much, I don't know. But <laughs> if I go to another forest, part of the forest, uh, which has a different, you know, different soils and stuff, but the same species, and I measure a tree that's 60 feet tall, but it's 80 years old, okay? That has a site index of 50. And what that means is that 50 years old, that tree is gonna be 50 foot tall. And all that tells us uh, really as a, in forestry and when we're assessing, it tells us that this is a, A is a better growing site. That tree is gonna be taller at the same age of 50 years old, base age of 50, compared to that other tree on the other site. And, and you'll say, well, where do they get all these curves from? And, and, and that's kind of my point is that over many, many years, there's been a lot of data that's collected looking at how forests grow across different types of sites to get an idea of, of how they're gonna grow in those different sites. And what this tells us as a, as a, as a, for silviculture purposes is that, hmm, if that, you know, there's certain trees that we know are gonna grow better on those better sites. In other words, have better site quality. They grow taller in a shorter period of time. Um, and perhaps those are the trees that we have to uh, want to favor in our decisions. And I, I know this is probably a little bizarre, but and, and even if you don't totally understand it, my point is that understand that there's a lot that goes into this in terms of measuring site quality and making decisions on what types of trees grow best on different areas. And we have actually quantitative ways to assess that. So um, I'm gonna move on realizing I've over, maybe I've confused okay. you a bit. <laughs> no, but Jonathan, we have several questions in the chat box. Um, the first one was while you had the previous slide, you showed uh, the different trees on a site and um, someone asked, are these trees intended to be of the same species? Uh, they don't have to be, no. I mean, that's, and that's the complicating factor. If these were all the same, if this was an even age forest, in other words, all these trees were kind of the same species or whatever even age. That might be, but in most cases, that's not the case. You know, there's going to be different species. And of course, that's, that's the complicating thing because some trees are going to grow at a faster rate. And on a certain site, they're just going to be more competitive. So for example, if you have a good fertile soils and you have yellow poplar trees, they're going to outpace all the other trees just because they grow faster. And they're going to overtop those other trees. But again, you may have some oaks that are in there as well. So, um, uh, I'm not sure if that, that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. And yeah. so then the next two questions were um, from the next slide. And someone asks, so all other things being equal, species, sunlight, et cetera, the larger tree indicates the better site, right? So no, the larger, no, the larger tree, uh, remember, this is all based on site indexes based on trees that have not been, um, overtopped or anything during their lifetime. A tree could be larger just because it, it won out in the competition uh, for sunlight. So this is, this is kind of looking, saying for all those trees that are dominant you know, in, the, in the forest, we wouldn't be looking at ones that have been shaded really pretty much at all. Um, again, it gets, it gets a little complicated, I have to admit, but um, I'm not sure that I, I totally answered that question. Okay. Um, the next question was just height and <coughs> BH is the metric to assess site index? That's correct. So the hard part many times is finding a tree that has been free to grow its entire life. Because in many cases, these trees have been overtopped by other trees. So it, this is only something that's done on very, very few trees. You know, you don't go out drilling all these trees. Uh, this is done just to kind of get an idea of, of the site quality of, a, of an area that you've gone into perhaps, and you want to get some quantitative idea of, of how the trees are growing. And it's for each of these graphs are for different species. So this is for upland oak. There's a separate site index curve for yellow poplar and for pine and for other species. 
Okay, and can you just uh, explain what DBH is for us? DBH is how we measure diameter in trees. It's called diameter breast height. In other words, anytime that somebody says a tree is 12 inches in diameter, what they mean is it's 12 inches in diameter at diameter breast height, which is four and a half feet from the ground. It's a standard term that we use in forestry to know that's where we measure diameter. We don't measure it at the ground. It's measured always at four and a half feet off the ground. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Thank you. Okay. And I understand that this was kind of a, a complicated concept to put up there, but so um, let's look at how do we measure, you know, uh, one thing we do, one thing a forester will do to get an idea of inventory and looking at how trees are growing is to use what's called an increment borer. And that's what this instrument is here. It's, it's a very strong steel. You actually drill it into the tree. It has a little uh, pusher that goes in here and you pull out a core of wood and it's kind of like a tree's uh, medical history okay and we can tell how well the tree is growing by looking at this uh, because you know the, the better the, the more resources it has and the more light that it has uh, the wider the growth rings are going to be each of these growth rings is one year so you know as the canopy uh, starts to close things tend to get you know good smaller growth rings or if you have drought if you have some type of defoliation, uh, but especially when the trees start to get crowded, uh, that's an indication that, oh, this forest really needs to be opened up because we need to allow the crown more area to grow. Uh, and that's gonna increase diameter growth. So um, increment borer is a, is a really pretty cool instrument. Everybody usually gets a big kick out of that, but it's, it's kind of like a tree's medical record because you can kind of see how it's grown over its lifetime going right into, and you can, and this is of course how you would get the total age of the tree. Um, so why do in, in, in rings indicate fast growth, uh, slow rings indicate slow growth? Jonathan, uh, does, another, yeah. I'm sorry, does it hurt the tree when you do a core like that? No, these are, and again, this is something you can, just a lot of effort to do this. You would only pick out, uh, you know, one or two trees and actually do this too, but no, Typically you put the core back into the tree, but even if you don't, uh, it's the sap gets exudes out of it and it, it just fills it in. Um, if it's a very high quality tree, perhaps you would probably drill it closer to the ground. Um, uh, but uh, you, usually you don't drill a lot of trees like this, but typically it doesn't hurt the trees. Okay, thank you. Now, if I was in an urban context, I'd be more concerned about that, but uh, in rural context, really not. Um, Another concept we use in forestry is called basal area. And this is an interesting way of, of measuring how much uh, wood is growing, how many trees are growing in an area. And the way to think about basal area is that it's the sum of the cross-sectional area of tree stems four and a half feet from the ground, which is what we told, said is DBH, right? And just imagine this, you have an acre of ground, you go up four and a half feet off the ground, you cut, you get a with a big buzz saw and you cut off all the trees. And for all those trees that are typically above seven inches in diameter, uh, usually, you would add up all that cross-sectional area. And it gives you so many square feet of basal area. So what does that mean? All right, just think about that. Um, what it means, that's directly related to the stocking and how many trees can grow there. So for example, we could have basal area of 100 square feet of basal area. It could be in a lot of little trees like this, right? Or it could be in a few big trees, all right? And what's been worked out over many, many years is that is there's a lot of tables that shows us exact stocking is optimal, you know, given the size of the, the number of tree, the density of the trees to tell us, you know, what should the stocking be of the trees that are in there in order to provide vigorous growth of the forest. And that's how we make decisions about thinning, okay? To say that, oh, and it isn't just, you know, happenstance, this is all stuff that's been worked out from, you know, a, you know, 100, 100, 100 years of, of forestry research and looking at how trees grow. And uh, you know, how do we measure basal area in the field? Well, one thing you find out about forestry is that we have very simple instruments that you could use in the woods. And, uh, and a lot of them have a lot of math behind them. And um, I can't, it's hard to explain this except to say that we use a little glass prism. 
And, and this glass prism is adapted such that when you look at it, hold it at eye level, and you look at it at the tree at diameter or breast height, if the tree, if, it, if that glass cuts across here, that means that tree counts as so many feet of basal area. If it's separated out, that means it's too far away to count and somewhere on the line. So most basal area prisms, each uh, count is 10 square feet of basal area. So that means you stand in a circle, you go around, and for all those trees, like on the left you see here that are overlapping, each of those trees counts as 10 square feet of basal area. And I can go around and I can say, okay, well, there's 100 square feet of basal area here, all right? And then I can go around and I take a plot and I can calculate how many trees per acre there are in a small, by, by measuring a small plot. And I'm not gonna explain the, the math behind this, but again, out of this little tiny prism, there's just a lot of math involved and in, uh, in trigonometry involved in how, how that works, but it works. Um, so again, uh, what, what you find with most forestry instruments is they're very simple things. You can take them in the woods, you can drop them, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very low end technology, but there's a lot of math behind all this. And that's the case with a, a prism. So how this is used in, in silviculture, okay, is to say that we've worked over the years, they've worked out all these tables that relates basal area to the number of trees per acre. And, and really just understand what this is telling us. This is for hardwood trees in general, okay. We go out with a prism and we'll take a number of plots. And if you ever go out with a forester in the woods, he'll take out a prism and do something. You'll see him looking through something like that. And let's say there's 90 square feet of basal area. And then he may have like a plot center and he'll go out about uh, 30, 32, 36 feet, whatever I think is like a 10th of an acre. I forget exactly. And they'll measure all the number of trees that are within that 10th acre. Okay, so if there's, you know, uh, uh, and, and basically, if that's, uh, you know, one tenth, then you multiply, you multiply that times 10 to get the number of trees per acre. And we have all these tables, these stocking tables that have been worked out. And the only, the, the only thing you really have to understand from that is that, for example, if I went out and measured um, uh, a, a plot and I had 120 square feet of basal area, okay, when I walked around that, with that 10 square basal, basal area prism, I counted 12 trees, okay, that were actually counted in. And then when I went out and counted 250 trees per acre, that puts me in the overstocked range. And, and the only thing you really need to get out of that is that based on this assessment and, and, and past research and knowledge about the silvics and silviculture, we know that that forest is overstocked. There's just too many trees there. And it's stopping, it's stopping the forest and, and from growing um, at a more vigorous rate. So a recommendation might be, well, that forest needs to be thinned uh, to get it down to a lower level so that remove some of those poor quality trees so that those other trees can take up that growing space and grow. So um, there's these type of stocking tables that have been worked out for a number of species. This is for kind of hardwood species in general. There's ones for different pine species um, and all kinds of things. And it's really based on two measurements. You know, it's based on the basal area per acre and then the number of trees per acre, which I just measure with a, a plot. So, and then I can start go further. I can say, well, what percent of those trees are desirable trees? Ones that we'd really like to keep here in the stand or ones that are invasive species or whatever. Um, so I, I just kind of throw that back. I, I hope that makes sense, you know, that, so this is all part of this whole inventory thing of collecting data and making you realize that silviculture is based on a lot of science. It's, it's based on a lot of, of research that's been done. And it's also based on being able to use fairly simple instruments to gather this data in the woods. So again, I can't see the, um, uh, um, I can't see the chat box, but I don't know if there's any other questions, if that makes yeah, sense. One new question. Uh, it says, are most silviculturists concerned with lumber primarily, or are you 
thinking of ecology, non-timber forest products, et cetera? Well, that's a great question because, you know, many, most people are not interested in maximizing timber production, okay? They're interested in wildlife habitat. Uh, they're interested in just forest health. One thing we do know about forest is that in a general, it, I always say forests, are, are trees are kind of like people. The more vigorous they are, uh, the more likely they are able to sustain, you know, uh, attacks by insects and disease and other things like that. And that's the case with a lot of forests, you know, if we're interested in general forest health, you know, we want to have the forest being able to not be so suppressed and slow growing that it opens itself to other problems. So most landowners are interested in, uh, you know, wildlife and things. So, for example, one, one idea of thinning, we know that the forest is overstocked, okay? We may not just keep the best timber trees, we may keep some other trees. For example, I want to keep some of the oak trees. Maybe they're not even the best trees in, this, in the forest there, but I'm going to keep those because I know they produced a lot of mass for wildlife. And by opening those trees up and removing some of the others, I can produce more mass for wildlife. Uh, or by opening up the canopy and allowing more light in, I'm going to get more understory development. And that's going to present, that's going to provide more wildlife habitat. So, so I, you know, that's one job of a forester is a lot of these prescriptions, like I said at the beginning, it's, it's really based on what the landowner objectives are, but we can use this science of silviculture to manage the forest in a way that's gonna help us reach them, but also produce a healthy forest. So, okay. Um, so, you know, when we look at how a forest develops, you know, we start out with a lot of little trees, maybe 10,000 stems to the acre uh, of this, these are all poplar. They start thinning themselves out to 1,000. You know, at the end of the day, you end up with 150 trees per acre, let's say. What happens to all those other trees? And, and that's the whole point of silviculture is that we're kind of mimicking nature. You know, a lot of cases, most of these trees are gonna die anyway. We're just directing to grow the growth into into certain areas that we think are, are, are more desirable. So if you think about it that way, it makes a lot more sense. And of course we have those stocking tables and other things that we can help make the, the sound decisions. Um, Jonathan? Yeah. There are a couple more questions. Sure. Um, so this might be a better question for later, but generally when harvesting for good forest health, and or thinning, will clear cuts or selective cuts be used? Yeah, I'll follow that. I'm going to cover that at the end. Okay. I mean, you and can use both. And they have, they have different purposes, okay? So yes. a, th a, thinning, a thinning is basically intended to improve growth of the existing forest. A clear cut is really meant to regenerate the forest. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we're creating a new forest. So uh, I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll Boy, it is getting time rolls on here. Um, <laughs> so uh, there, there is one more question yeah. you probably answer quickly. Um, and this is referring back to the tables and things. It says, are there metrics based upon young trees to determine if there are too many deer or other grazers? Uh, well, they're stocking tables, usually for trees that are smaller in diameter and those are for larger. Um, but deer, another issue, deer are really affecting the regeneration. So for example, here, that, that's the whole reason, you know, how do we know what's gonna happen when we harvest those trees? How do we know things are gonna be regenerated? Because we know there's certain, there's seedlings, that, that's how things are reproduced. Seedling sprouts, which are little seedlings, which just, you know, get cut off and then come back. There's sprouts that come from the stump. And there's many times root suckers that come up, all right? So one of the issues with deer is that they're eating all the regeneration. <laughs> so yeah, they're a major factor that has to be considered. Uh, perhaps you're gonna have to use some fencing. You're going to have to leave more, um, you're gonna have to leave more seed sources or other trees because you know that the regeneration is gonna have a hard time uh, escaping the deer, yeah. Jonathan, do you want us to save questions to the end in the interest yeah. of time? Yeah, let's, let's do that. Okay. So 
you know, there's a couple of different regeneration strategies for different species. You know, some come in by wind and some are acorns, some are distributed by animals. Um, um, and, you know, with pine trees, you know, pines are very good, very good at reproducing themselves, but we tend to usually use uh, seedlings that come from nurseries because we can control the actual stocking rate. You know, many times 450 or 600 trees per acre for pine trees. Uh, unlike hardwood trees, which I'll get to a little bit later. But um, so uh, many cases for pine, we're actually, we're actually controlling the regeneration through plant planting. It has a lot of advantages. Uh, for hardwoods, you know, one thing you remember, a big thing to remember, pine trees do not re-sprout, hardwood trees do. So people say, well, why aren't you, re why aren't you replanting those hardwood uh, trees in the forest that you cut down because that's not how we regenerate hardwoods. We regenerate hardwood forests, they come from sprouts from the stumps and from little small seedlings that might be in the understory. And, uh, and that's a big thing that many people just don't understand. Uh, and this is what you see, here's an old, this is an old rotten stump here. Um, this is not a good stump sprout. The stump sprouts need to come from below uh, the stump line at the basal collar. But that's what this was. This was a stump sprout, two stump sprouts. There was a stump here that rotted away. And these are perfectly good trees. But trees that come off the top of the stump, they're no good. No good. Uh, some trees produced from uh, need mineral soil, like yellow poplar. Uh, this was after a harvest. These are all yellow poplar seedlings. Probably, probably I don't know, be tens of thousands of seedlings per acre. At the end of the day, they're going to end up to be a couple hundred trees per acre. Uh, but of course, invasives also come in a lot of these soils, a big issue. Uh, and oaks, you know, oaks have a different strategy. They don't produce by seed, really. They, they produce by seed, but they establish themselves in the understory. And then um, uh, they basically grow their taproot. They grow up a little bit, then they die back. They grow up and die back. And for many of these little oak seedlings in the woods, if you were to pull them up, many times those roots those roots of those little uh, oak seedlings could be 10 to 20 years old. And so as soon as they get an opening in the canopy, they're basically take off and they're able to compete with the other species, but it's a very different strategy compared to other, other species. Uh, of course, you know, we have a big problem with regenerating oaks and like you just mentioned, deer. This is a deer fence here. This is without deer, this is with deer. And of course, does this affect silviculture? Absolutely. And uh, that's why in many cases, in order to regenerate a forest or to get any understory development, you fence the deer out. Um, because you're just not going to get that advanced regeneration in a hardwood forest that actually you depend upon to regenerate the forest. So it's a major factor in silvicultural decisions that uh, affect, uh, you know, silvicultural prescriptions and stuff like that for forests. Uh, these are just root sprouts, you know, things like, well, everybody knows the tree of heaven, but the aspen and um, some other species, you know, regenerate a lot by, uh, by this. Uh, one thing you have to worry about when you open up a forest too much is you get what's called epicormic branching. And that's basically this light stimulates these buds under the bark and you start getting all these branches that come out and it degrades the quality of the trees and uh, it's not a good thing. And that's why stocking is so important. You know, you want to open up the forest so that it'll grow, but at the same time, you don't want to open it up too much because you'll get this epicormic branching and the trees will basically just not uh, hold the character for us to be almost like a, uh, the way a lawn tree is. You know, it just will tend to grow out instead of up which is what you want in a forest. So, so the question becomes, you know, how do all these silviculture methods compare to each other? And, and there's even age management where, you know, forests are, are generated, they're pretty much all the same age. There's uneven age management and there's intermediate treatments. And they really differ, okay, based on how much light or how much of the canopy is removed. That's the easiest way to think about a lot of this. Um, like I said, uh, Intermediate, we'll talk about intermediate treatments and then the others. I'll give you some examples and pictures, but um, it's important to understand that for, um, that's, that's really the main difference. Even age management is you're removing all the canopy at some point, 
maybe in stages like you see with the clear cut and siege tree and so on. On even age management, you're having single or you know, groups of trees. And then intermediate is like a thinning. You're just helping improve the growth of the existing forest. You're not, you're not regenerating the forest at that point. At least that's not the intent. So um, let's, let's look at these couple of things. Intermediate versus improvement and regeneration cutting, okay? Um, and, and intermediate or, you know, stands and, and thinnings are basically, you have too many trees, you know, you want to reduce the stocking and you're just, you're doing it for a lot of different reasons. It can improve vigor, uh, could be derived some income. It just depends on, on the situation. Um, this is usually occurs when the, you know, the, the crowns are getting too crowded. Um, uh, you're getting some disease and injury. And the point is that you're removing certain trees. So you're changing the species composition in many cases, you have that option, but you're allowing the growth to be put on those, desire, those trees that you leave instead of that growth being put on all the trees. And to perform thinnings like this, that's where you would use those stocking tables. You would say that, well, I need to take out, you know, uh, 30 square feet of basal area. And that would be just by you know, using a prism, you could see the trees and with experience, that's a relatively easy thing to do. You would mark certain trees to come out and you typically take out the diseased and injured ones. But again, if wildlife is more of an option, you would certainly, you would at least maybe den trees or perhaps even leave some poor quality oak trees because they had high wildlife value. And again, you have this whole, you know, this whole canopy. So uh, just to give you an example, um, what you don't want to do, well, I'm going to go right past this because that will be an interesting time. But um, uh, this is just an example before some type of a thinning or timber stand improvement. You know, it might be this tree with it's a low fork or a very limmy, a very crowded. This is a poor species. And maybe after some type of thinning, it might look like this. And again, what exactly what trees come out depends on the objectives. But the point is that you're opening up the canopy, you're allowing those remaining trees to grow out and they're gonna grow faster in diameter. Um, and I'll just, I'm just i not gonna do this one because of the interest of time. But this can show, this is an example I've used many times and this is from a oak, young oak stand, okay? And to show how different, how bit, what a difference thinning can make. These were two parts of a forest. Uh, it's a young oak, young oak forest. In this part of the forest, the, tr the forest was thinned, okay? And 25 years later, this is how much those trees grew in diameter, okay? The part that was unthinned, the trees were crowded, they were competing with each other, the crowns were tight together, um, it only grew this much in 25 years. And the difference in diameter is this, okay? <laughs> the unthinned part and the thin part. Now, I'm not here to say that every forest will respond like this, but I am saying that thinning can greatly increase the growth of the trees in the forest. And so for people that like to have big trees in their forest, you know, doing some type of a thinning operation to favor uh, the, the better trees, you're going to get bigger trees in a shorter period of time, typically. Um, so it's, it's just a basic, it's a basic principle, it does work. And it works better in some places than others, just depends on the, the species that are there. So, but this is a very graphic example of it. Um, you know, crop tree management is something that a lot of small landowners can use. We recommend it with small private landowners that just have a few acres or whatever. And this is just going in and selecting certain selective trees that they want to release. Uh, and the principle is the same, instead of thinning the entire forest, there's certain trees that they want to allow to grow and to be successful. They may be some, um, a lot of times, a lot of forests don't have many oak trees. Well, and they're being overtopped. So the way we can do that is we can release that tree. We can remove the canopies that are competing with that crop tree, as we call it. And it looks like this, is that you would just be looking up from the bottom. You can see in the lower right, all these trees around here where either they could be cut down or they can just be uh, they can just be girdled and killed in place. It's a lot of times it's hard to get them down. The result is that this tree no longer has any competition and its crown can expand. It's gonna get the light. Like I said, it's all about competing for light and it's going to grow. And uh, this is something that uh, 
landowners can do on very small properties. Uh, it's a very, very easy technique and we have uh, materials on that. So it's called crop tree release. Uh, what we want to avoid, and one of the biggest downfalls of, of, of poor forestry practice and poor silviculture is diameter limit cutting, or it's called high grading. What I've told you is that all trees, you know, have various growth rates. They may be in different condition. Whether a tree is going to be cut or not during a thinning or things like that depends on its individual characteristics. But in a lot of cases, you know, a lot of landowners will be approached by someone who'll say, well, we're just going to cut all the big trees and leave the little trees to grow. The, the problem is that those big trees are big because they want out in the competition for light. But those little trees are small because they've been overtopped and suppressed. And if they're released, they're just not going to be successful. So, you know, just cutting trees based on their diameter is kind of what's called high grading. Uh, it's, it's kind of like taking your biggest and your best trees and leaving the rest. And it doesn't contribute to... Uh, a good sustainable harvest and um, to good silviculture in general. Um, and this is kind of a, well, I'll, I'll just use this one here, but you can see it here, uh, this diagram. If these big trees, these are the big trees. If, if we cut all the trees of the large diameter at this, out of this forest area, what we're left with is this. And these trees over time just don't grow, okay? Many times they've been in the understory for so long uh, they're shocked by the environment of full sunlight. And this is an example. This, is, this was an area that was thinned, okay? And they left these trees to grow. But these were all, you know, trees that were like intermediate uh, in the canopy or even maybe some suppressed ones, but um, they were not vigorous. And once the, the, the full canopy was taken off, the environmental shock just killed them all. And what you end up with at that point is you're starting off with a, a pretty much clear cut at that point. So um, you just want to, you know, have make sound decisions in terms of if you're doing a thinning, uh, make sure the, the, the trees are selected for their individual characteristics. Um, so I want to move on to different types of, you know, intermediate harvests is we're trying to improve the growth of the remaining trees. Regeneration harvest is when we're trying to we're trying to regenerate the forest and even through an even or uneven age. Even age means that most of the trees are the same age. And this was an early, um, right after World War II, this was a, a, a chainsaw, one of the first chainsaws. It's a two person operation. Um, and there's different ways to do it. You know, clear cutting, okay? We talked about clear cutting, shelter wood cutting and sea tree cutting. These are all even age methods, but they just vary. So in many cases, clear cut is where you move all the trees, of course, Shelter wood is that you leave a, a, a fairly high density of trees. And this is used a lot with oak regeneration because you know, oak seedlings or oak nuts don't travel, acorns don't travel that far. So you want to, especially when you have high deer populations, you want to leave enough seed out in this area for a while such that oak seedlings can get a better chance of re regenerating. Um, and seed trees, just leaving a, tr a few trees, okay? Uh, this is used a lot in uh, pine management sometimes. And uh, it just varies on how it's applied, but the result is the same with the shelter wood and seed tree. Typically they would come back at a later point in time and remove those trees. The point is that those trees would basically be even age uh, forest. And, and this is how we manage pine. You know, pine management is very prescriptive. Not that much of that in, uh, in Garrett County. Uh, you have to get down into the Southeast primarily for a lot of pine and up in parts of New England, but we know how to do pine, it's a, it's a full cycle. You know, we clear cut, we establish the new trees with seedlings, we tend them and thin them, mature them, and then harvest them again. And it's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a pretty well-managed cycle. We know how to do that. Um, uh, it could be burning, it could be using different types of uh, herbicide, it could be um, mechanical treatment, um, just depends. And uh, trees are planted typically with genetically improved seedlings from a nursery. And then um, the trees are thinned. And the important thing is if you are planting trees like wobbly pine and white pine, you have to thin that area. Because if you don't, and many people probably have forests around their area that have not been thinned, like white pine and other forests. And what happens is the trees don't really naturally thin themselves. They just kind of 
stagnate. And then they become very susceptible to things like um, southern pine beetle and uh, white pine weevil, other types of uh, insects and disease problems. So if you are going to plant pine trees in a plantation type context, they really do need to be managed for the health of the, of the forest in the future. Um, they can be thinned, all kinds of different equipment here you see, and your the remaining trees grow at a faster rate and you end up with a mature pine stand and at some point it could be harvested and redone. And for many people that live in the Southeast, I mean, this can be done on a cycle of 30 to 40 years within a person's lifetime easily. Not so much up where we are in Northeast. Um, hardwood, pine, hardwood forestry is different. Uh, um, clear cutting looks uh, pretty messy, um, but most of the, all these areas were pretty much clear cut in the past. And what you see on the left here is a clear cut from the early 1900s in West Virginia pretty much of a mess. This is what that same area looks like 60 years later. So for many people in Western Maryland and up in the Appalachians, those areas were clear cut probably for, for the most part, but they've grown back into very high quality forests. And there's good reasons for that because the best genetics was allowed to be expressed. But once you get in there and you start high grading and taking out the better quality trees, the, the quality of the forest tends to degrade. So remember that uh, the forest is extremely forgiving. And even though clear cutting looks bad, uh, silviculturally, it's a, it's a very, it's a very, it could be a very beneficial practice in many cases. And as long as the roads are put in properly, there's not a big issues with erosion and things like that. Uh, different even age, these are some pictures of uh, clear cutting and uh, seed tree and shelter wood. This is a series of pictures from the Allegheny Plateau from 1927 of a clear cut. Okay, and it just shows you how the forest developed over the next uh, 70 years. It's just a progression of pictures. It's kind of cool. Uh, so this is 1928, and it follows two black cherry trees, of which you find up in the Allegheny Plateau. is a very good. Um, uh, it's a it's a great timber tree. It grows very well. Um, this is 10 years later. You see these two trees develop. 20 years. 30 years. 40 years, 50 years, 70 years. And so these trees were naturally thinning themselves out. And they could have benefited from thinning, but, uh, uh, make, but, but basically uh, these were a lot of the forests that you see up there now. So this is the natural progression of things uh, going from very dense uh, number of trees to smaller numbers of trees. Um, why clear cut? Well, you can rejuvenate very degraded forests. A lot of woodlands around here have had many entries into them. Many people just taking out the biggest, the best trees. And like you see in this picture here, just a lot of poor quality fork trees. I mean, they may have some wildlife habitat value, but at some point, lander may make a decision. They, they really want to improve the, the composition and the quality of the forest. And one thing that's really lacking in much of our area is young forest. And the, spe and the wildlife species that use young successional forests is very limited. And there's a big push to encourage practices like uh, uh, you know, small clear cuts to basically create more uh, habitat uh, for early successional wildlife. So um, that's a, a big movement. So this is just a couple of pictures of some clear cuts. This was one years later. And you know most people may actually after 10 years um, may not even notice that. Uh, a seed tree harvest that you see here, okay? Very widely scattered trees that might be removed later. This is used a lot with pine and with sometimes yellow poplar. Another one. This is a shelterwood harvest. You can see there's just a lot more trees there, uh, but big openings in the canopy. And this again is used a lot of times with the, for oak, encourage oak regeneration and um, get seed fall from the oaks. Um, the other uneven age management types are group selection and single tree selection. And this is where a lot of landowners get into, uh, to, uh, into trouble with people who aren't amazing using good silviculture practice. They say that, well, I'm going to go do a tree selection. Well, single tree selection. Well, is that single tree selection? Is this going in and getting the biggest and the best trees? Or is it taking a whole range of trees out of there, you know, different size trees? So you're improving it. And, um, uh, there's a kind of a confusion of terms there, I think. 
Um, but um, the, the point is that it says here, this is a Roche and Gigrich, it's a very um, uh, well-known foresters that developed a lot of materials. Sooner or later, the cost of past mistreatment must be paid, whether as an outlay for silvicultural improvement or as a sacrifice of productivity for many more years while nature does the improvement. In other words, nature grows it back in one way or another. And this could what come when you start doing a lot of single trees and taking out, you know, diameter limit cutting and just the biggest and the best trees. Um, you know, single tree selection is, is single entries, but it's, it's taking out a range of, not just from large trees, you're also taking out smaller trees as well. Yeah. And of course, uh, one of the main practices that's used for this type of thing is group selection. And this is kind of trying to mimic a more natural look instead of, you know, large clear cuts. Many of, well, this is really good for a lot of landowners. You have these one or two acre clear cuts, and then you maybe do a little thinning in between but you kind of create this diversity of age classes. So maybe every 10 years you come in and you, you, you do a couple more square clear, clear cuts. And what you get over time is this all aged forest, basically different groups that are different ages and it's a lot more diverse and, uh, and, and, and commercially it's something that can be done commercially effectively and you're not degrading the forest. You know, it's a, uh, um, it's, it's an interesting technique to, to, can be done well by, by a good forester. <clears throat> and this kind of looks like, this is a hole here. This was a, a group selection cut. This was an area of a, probably an acre or two. And you can see you have mature trees around the edges, but in that area of the open sunlight, this all came back into dense yellow poplar. And you have just a lot of diversity there in the landscape as you look across the forest. So um, those are some of the, uh, the, the, the different methods. And, uh, 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 you know, just so just remember, we have even age, even age management, which are pretty much regeneration methods. And then we do thinning, you know, which are kind of intermediate cuts to improve growth. So the question is, you know, what is, if you're working with a forester, what is, what is the objective of what's being done? And uh, uh, just a couple other things to talk about is that about, you know, there's a lot of hardwood tree planting going on these days. And uh, tree shelters protect them from deer or deer fencing, you know, around riparian barrier, uh, borders and buffers and stuff. Um, but, but I think it's really important to understand though, we never used to plant hardwood trees. We've always planted pine trees. It, it takes well to planting. Um, but plant, this practice of planting hardwood tree seedlings is something that's really never done. Now we would plant some walnut trees in plantations, but it's very difficult to do because in many cases, you're planting hardwood trees, which are a later successional species onto open fields where the, you know, where the soils and the, uh, the flora and fauna are not adapted to hardwood tree growth at that point. Uh, especially if you're talking about oaks and things that are more later successional trees. So it just takes a lot of care. And there's been a lot of poor success with a lot of hardwood plantings because, uh, you know, it's been a lot, real learning curve for foresters on how to do this successfully because it takes a lot of effort. You can't just stick the hardwood seedlings out there, put a tree tube on them and walk away because the tubes have to be maintained, but you have to control the competing vegetation for a number of years so that those trees can uh, grow and, uh, you know, be successful. And that's what most of the tree planting programs now uh, come with, you know, th at least three years or so or more of, of maintenance that's involved. So uh, just to tell you that it's a very expensive planting hardwood trees. Uh, and uh, it, it's part of many regulations, you know, for the Forest Conservation Act and so on and so forth. But um, it can be very, uh, very challenging. Uh, it needs to be done, you know, planting the right tree and done properly. Um, we don't do a lot of logging in suburban developments. Uh, not a lot of silviculture that happens there. It's going to be more individual trees. It can be done, but uh, it really depends on the ind individual situation. Um, just real quickly, uh, to make you realize that in silviculture recommendations and of course, best management practices, wetlands, threatened and endangered species, these are all part of the uh, decision-making process in terms of what might be done or areas that might be protected. Um, uh, and that's all part of the, uh, the decisions that are made uh, when it comes to harvesting. Um, and uh, most of our state regulations for erosion and sediment control, 
Of course, there are endangered species concerns. Most landowners I know are very much want to protect and enhance any endangered species on their property and uh, are more than willing to do so. Um, but there are specific recommendations for you know, soil and erosion control, erosion and sediment control, so that if a, a timber harvest is done, Maryland, you, know, you have to get a plan approved by soil conservation. And if it's around a blue line stream, you have to get a, a professional forester to develop a, a, a plan for a stream sound management zone. So Maryland's highly regulated when it comes to this kind of stuff, uh, no question about it. And the most important thing with, with soils is to protect your soil mat, your root mat. Whenever you're disturbing the root mat, you know, 70, 80% of the, of, the, uh, of the roots of the tree are within the first you know, 12 inches of the surface. So if there is gonna be soil disturbance, it's important to, um, to stabilize it with, uh, with, with, with uh, uh, vegetation and planting and things like that to avoid problems in the past. And that's really the purpose of a lot of the uh, sediment and erosion control plans. And you know, make sure the stream crossings are done, the, the roads are constructed properly. Good point. Clear cutting does not cause erosion. What causes erosion always is basically roads. So as long as roads are pretty much put in properly and using all the techniques that are known, uh, erosion is going to be a, min a, a minimal, minimal factor. And uh, a lot of the studies that have been out there shows that uh, most of the logging jobs. Um, are, are fairly compliant with the uh, best management practices for forestry out there. Uh, it may look for like a mess when it's being done, but uh, the idea is you have a good operator gets in there and cleans things up before they leave the site. And so the, my last slide is this, how do I get, how do I practice good silviculture? Well, my recommendation to most people is to use a professional forester with any type of harvest operation. And if you're not in a big hurry is, in the state of Maryland, the state foresters will do written forest stewardship plans, but private consultant foresters will also do them. And there is what's called cost share assistance to help for private foresters to do that. And many of them will do excellent job. Um, I can't say so much for other states. Uh, they have maybe fewer foresters available and it's handled differently. I know West Virginia consulting foresters write all the plans. Um, and I think it's the same pretty much in um, Pennsylvania. Uh, but Maryland has licensed professional foresters. I'm a licensed professional forester by the state and accountable to a commission. I know that uh, Pennsylvania does not. Anybody in Pennsylvania can call themselves professional foresters. So if you're working with a forester, make sure that uh, they have some professional credentials. Uh, you know, they have, and, and, and that's very important. Um, we have a list of private consultant foresters on our website, and many of them are from Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Um, and that would be a good place to start. So, and if you're going to, again, do a, a, a harvesting or timber sale, some type of harvesting, you know, get professional assistance. And just by like listening to this, uh, you know, educate yourself so you understand some of the questions, ask a lot of questions. And most important, uh, you know, if you're going to hire a consulting forester, uh, and if typically they're being paid for their services, either by a percentage of the sales or whatever, you know, you want to make sure you just feel comfortable and that they represent your interests. And so referrals from other people, asking to look at other jobs they've done is all very acceptable. So I know I've gone on uh, about a little over an hour. So um, uh, I probably shouldn't have gone into uh, site index, uh, <laughs> but uh, as much, but uh, that's about what I have at this point. And uh, this is my contact information. And at this point, I think I'll take questions. Okay, Jonathan. I, I thought the site index stuff was interesting. I learned something there. But um, <coughs> all right, so I'll try and go back up here to where the questions started after we decided to wait. You know, till I'll, the I'll say I'll say one thing. Uh, okay. A lot of the teaching I've done is face to face, and with that particular concept, you know, site index curve, and explaining that. It's just so much easier when you're face to face with people. So uh, this is actually one of the oh, first sure. times I've done it online. <laughs> so anyway, go well, ahead. That was great. Um, so, okay, so someone asked uh, if you have ever used prescribed burns or I don't know if they're asking you personally or if we do that in Maryland. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. So there's a big push, yeah. Prescribed burning is an excellent tool. 
And, uh, you know, up until the 50s, the woods used to be burned all the time. People would go out and regularly burn the woods. And that was really beneficial to oak regeneration because oaks could, like I told you, have a big taproot, hickories as well. And they could get the top burned off and they would re-sprout. And it was very beneficial for oak regeneration. We didn't have the deer either. Uh, so uh, prescribed burning is used, um, been using a lot in hardwood forests, you know, low intensity fire to encourage oak regeneration. There's just a lot of issues with smoke, uh, but there's a lot of issues with the control, you know, because you have to make sure that it can only be done at certain times of year. And, uh, you know, you have to have the, uh, the, the technical people, but there is a big push to do more of that. Now, prescribed burning is still used, is used a lot in pine management. Um, so uh, in the Southeast, uh, where it's very much easy, if you have a clear cut, you would put a fire line around the, the clear cut and then after the site, you know, after the site was harvested, you have all the slash and either the slash would be piled up or it could be just burned, you know, across it. But you have to have, make sure everything's dry, it has to be the right time of year. And you have to have the, 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 the human resources to make sure it doesn't, you know, jump the fire line. But uh, I know there's a real effort to in, increase the use of prescribed burning, but, but it has its challenges. Thank you. Okay, so um, here's another question. Presumably there are concerns about genetic diversity when restocking with nursery bred stock. Can you speak about that? Um, well, okay. And I think the, probably the person that's getting this concerned about GMO stuff, like ge genetically modified material and stuff. And that's a, that's a good point because it's not that. The way uh, seedlings are selected. The way seed is grown in a, a pine nursery is that they go out into the wild. You select the best, uh, the best trees they can find, like say for a wild pine, and find the best trees they can. Take those pine cones and that seed, and then they grow it in a uh, a nursery, and uh, uh, they plant the trees that demonstrate the best what's called like phenotypic characteristics, you know, the best growth characteristics. And they select from those and they'll basically establish a, a seed orchard, you know, a plantation, just specifically with widely spaced trees. And they, for the purpose of growing pine cones for seed, and then that seed will be, be what is used to grow the seedlings in the nursery that are then sold out. So there's no genetic modification of of the actual genetics of the tree. It's just selecting the best trees in the wild and propagating them in a, in a orchard type of uh, uh, plantation context. Does that, does that, does that help? I hope it's not genetic. We're, we're not, we're not altering genes or anything like that. Okay. It's, it's just taking, it's the same way you would, um, uh, I don't, I don't know. You might do in a, uh, in a flower bed or something, you know, the biggest, you want, you want, you pick the best flowers or whatever. Hi, sorry. Um, I was actually not terribly worried about GMO and more worried about um, a very small selection basis and the phenotypical um, selection basis as opposed to a much wider uh, thing. So thank you. If you've got anything more, that would be great, but um, thank you. Yeah, you know, I'm not an expert on that, but, um, you know, these the, they come from a number of uh, seed orchards. In many cases, some of the cones come from uh, uh, natural sources. You know, just going out in the woods. But that would probably be a better question, honestly. I I'm not a geneticist. I understand what you're saying, but uh, I, I get the feeling there's a lot of diversity out there. But um, that would be something to ask a forest geneticist. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next question is, uh, what do you mean by advanced regeneration? So advanced regeneration is stuff that's in the understory uh, that typically uh, can become, you know, dominant in the future. So for example, for oaks, uh, one of the sources of regeneration for oaks is advanced oak regeneration. And those are like small diameter seedlings that are in the understory. And we know from a lot of research, those, those oak seedlings or, or those oak stems need to be about four and a half feet in height or more in order to be competitive when the overstory is removed. So that's what we're talking about. It's like if you're walking through the forest 
and say, oh, there's a, you know, there's a, a small oak tree, you know, maybe it's just like a, an inch, half an inch in diameter, an inch, or maybe it's just only growing a couple feet off the ground. That's advanced regeneration. And its size will dictate usually how successful it's going to be um, if, if the forest was harvested. So that's one of the things that actually goes into uh, calculating, um, uh, you know, the, the regeneration in the future is the amount of those stems that are in the understory, as well as uh, the number of like stumps that are out there, because we know that stumps are going to produce very vigorous uh, sprouts. Okay. Um, so while we're answering questions, uh, Ashley has put up a, a poll, some poll questions. If you could go ahead and answer those while we're uh, discussing these questions, we'd appreciate that. So the next question is, uh, do you feel there is a demand for more tree stock nurseries for the purpose of silviculture or habitat restoration? Well, I think what we've seen is a lot of um, development of you know, native plant nurseries. Uh, developing seedlings for a lot of tree planting projects. And again, uh, that comes from a lot of this emphasis now on planting native hardwoods, you know. Uh, and then of course, the, each of the state nurseries, they typically will grow hardwood seedlings uh, for sale for private landowners. But I know there's a lot of private nurseries as well that do the same thing. And sometimes they'll differ. Sometimes they'll be bare root seedlings. Some of them will produce seedlings that are in tubes. They have a better chance of success. They might be a larger size. So over the years, you know, I've seen these uh, native plant nurseries that have come along to kind of meet the demand for um, for more native, you know, hardwood tree and shrub species. Okay. So another question is, why would someone choose seed tree management? Um. Well, that's a good question. Uh, and, and, and I'll say, for example, there is a there is a regeneration law, I believe, says if you know if you have a pine forest, I think for yellow poplar as well, you either have to replant, you have to replant it with you know seedlings for a nursery, or you have to leave a certain number of seed trees per acre. Uh, I know that's the case in Virginia. I think it's in Maryland as well, and we always encourage landowners to use. Um, Genet you know, genetically improved uh, seedlings from nurseries. And, and a lot of that's primarily because, you know, you can control the density, you know, you can prepare the site uh, compared to uh, natural seed, you're just gonna come in, it's gonna be extremely dense. Um, but there is actually regulation uh, on that. So if you're a landowner, uh, and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the same in Maryland as it was in Virginia. If you're going to harvest that stand, then either you have to plant it or you need to leave a certain number of seed trees per acre to provide seed to regenerate the area. Okay. Um, another question is what kind of herbicide treatment do you use primarily? Uh, cut stem application or more broad spread application? For uh, the question is for what though? What, um, what, yeah, what I mean, type of application? Uh, you know, if you're using like a, um, like a crop tree management where you're just trying to kill individual trees, you could use a hack and squirt method, which is, you know, with an ax and a uh, 50% mixture of like Roundup uh, or of uh, glyphosate or something like that. Um, or you can cut the tree down and use the stump treatment. Um, if it's more extensive area like foliar treatments, um, it's just going to depend on what kind of vegetation is there. Um, I mean, glyphosate's used uh, a lot and uh, arsenal. Uh, as well for like uh, controlling vegetation on clear cuts. I can't, I can never remember the exact name of Arsenal, the, uh, the active ingredient. Okay, this question is about when you showed us the picture of a clear cut of that um, place in West Virginia, and then you had the photos six, of 60 years later. And the question is, uh, where is the understory in the photo on the right, which is 60 years later? Yeah, that's a good point because uh, I mean, I'm not sure exactly where that is. Now you will get in a lot of mature forest stands like that where there is just no light and uh, you're not gonna get much understory vegetation at all. Um, but deer can also be a big factor there. 
uh, that's for sure. I'm not sure what the case is there, but you know, if you work through many really big, old, mature forests, you will find many cases that uh, there's not much understory. But um, uh, what you typically find a lot of places, and this is very common in Maryland, is that you have a, a, a mature overstory and then nothing else underneath. And that's because of deer. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, I, you saw that in the one picture, I had the picture of the fence. On the one side, there was you know, a lot of vegetation, understory vegetation. On the other side, there was nothing. And then that's a huge issue silviculturally because if those trees are to be harvested, what's gonna come in? Well, in many cases, the invasives are gonna be much more competitive uh, than the others. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, another question I think is about um, assessing sites. And it says after 20 years, can an experienced eye tell a clear cut from an old farm site or do they basically look the same? Um, tell a mature woodland from an old farm site? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and that would be, well, first of all, you could look for, um, signs of you know walls and things like that but typically it's going to be a lot of it's going to be based on species that might be there uh, in many cases a lot of farm sites you're going to find a lot more grapevine which can be a huge issue because you know the birds have brought it in you so see what happens with an old agricultural site is the field it gets abandoned and you know you get a lot of brush which you know transitions into a mature forest but you have a lot of birds and stuff and they're dropping seeds from all kinds of things and uh, you're going to get all kinds of uh, vines and other, a lot of invasives in many cases. And what, what that contrasts with a, an area that's been in forest for a long period of time, the species are probably going to be different as well. So for example, if you go into a woodland and there's a lot of beech, okay, uh, and big sugar maples, you know, those are very tolerant trees. Those, those, that's a very old forest because those are not the things that come in. They're, they're not, they don't like sunlight. Those are not the trees that typically come in first on an area. So uh, that's an indication just from the species about the fact that that forest has been there for a long period of time. Okay, very good. Um, I think you answered part of the question about prescribed burning, but the other part of this question is in reference to prescribed burns. Um, would you use that as a means to favor wildlife, nurturing oaks over thinner bark trees, such as maple? Yeah, I mean, and that's actually why, you know, one of the main reasons I think for the, part of the reason for the decline in oak is that, you know, prescribed, you know, burning was stopped. It used to be, you know, up through the 50s, uh, people used to burn the woods on a regular basis. It was just something people did to keep out snakes and things like that. Um, a lot of old timers, you know, would just burn the woods and would forest, you know, with Smoky Bear and all that. And, um, you know, a lot of that stopped. So you're right. Um, there's not that much fire anymore. So all those thinner bark species are, are, can compete and uh, the oaks are not successful. Okay, I think this might be our last question. So, or maybe this is a comment. So the detail, including site index stuff, was useful for RLAs who have become rough, rough on NRI FSDSs. Well, I guess you might know what that means, Jonathan. But <laughs> hold on, let me uh, let me um, uh, let me let me uh, stop my uh, okay. I was looking for the uh, the chat here. Okay. Yeah, okay, so it's near the end. And there is one more question. Okay, ask me that. I, I can't get it for some reason. What's the question again? Okay, let me, I think it's just more of a comment. Oh. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a question. I was just saying thanks, because uh, we get rusty on that stuff, and uh, it's helpful. The detail is helpful. Well, you know, I think the thing, uh, the point to get to people is that you know, a lot of times, you know, there's a, just a lot of science behind forestry. Yes. <laughs> and there's a lot of math there, like I said, and I didn't mention about a tree scale stick, right? Most people maybe know. In a tree scale stick, you use that to measure how many logs are in a tree in diameter. You know, it's full of trigonometry, but it's a stick you can take into the woods, you can drop it, you can hit things with it, and yet it gives you all this data. <laughs> 
And it's the same thing with like a prism, you know, which is this little thing which you could do the same thing to, but it gives you incredibly uh, good information. Yep. Okay, I think I've got one final question. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to take down a three foot diameter ash tree due to emerald ash borer. <coughs> Dormant buds around the base of the cut stump have sprouted, resulting in a dozen four foot tall sprouts. Should I let the tree regenerate? Well, you know, I was just at a site in a wetland and, that, and that's what we were seeing is just a lot of basil sprouting. Well, the only sprouts you want to remain are ones that actually come from below ground level. You know, if they're coming from the top of the stump, you know, above there, they're, they're going to die because the stump's going to rot and they're going to fall over. But the big question now with Emerald Ash Borer is what's going to happen to those basil sprouts? Are they going to be successful? So you may want to, you may want to prune it back to, uh, you know, maybe three or four of your better ones. Um, but really the future of that, I don't know. I, I will tell you that this is interesting silvicultural thing. Uh, with, the, with the loss of uh, ash, which in many cases is kind of mixed in with other stuff. In some cases, it makes up a larger component. What has been the result silviculturally? And what I've seen in a lot of areas is that <laughs> it's just, you know, it's opened up the understory, but in many of these areas, there's so many invasives like uh, multiflora rose and uh, uh, you know bush honeysuckle or whatever and it's allowed the invasives just to take off <laughs> so it has hasn't been a good thing in a lot of areas I've seen so unfortunately so this whole emerald ash borer mortality you know is definitely having effect on on you know silvicultural effects okay well I think that's it 